Uh, my name is Orleni Rojas. I'm an alum of the School of Social Services here at Fordham University. I work at the Center for Core Innovation. I've been with the Center for um, 10 years now. And while there, I've worked on a range of um, different projects and programs all related to um, criminal justice and social justice. Um, I'm here with my colleague uh, from CASES. Diego Valdez. Who will also present on his agency, CASES, and, and the work that they do in general. But in specific, we're both here to speak to you about um, our supervised release program, which is expanding as a result of bail reform, which was passed earlier this year in Albany. And so we'll share with you um, the things that we do, but also in particular how our program is getting ready um, for bail reform come January 1st, and the role that we hope social workers play, um, which is a front and center, front of the line role. So the Center for Core Innovation, it is a nonprofit dedicated to creating a more effective and humane justice system by designing and implementing operating programs, performing all the original research, and providing reformers around the world with the tools needed to launch new strategies. Um, what that really means is that we have a research department and we research um, different topics, different theories. Uh, we have a practice area and that's what we call our demonstration projects. And that's where we actually implement programming that gets then researched for its um, effectiveness and efficacy. And then we have what we call a technical assistance or expert assistance department, which then goes nationally and internationally to other jurisdictions and other countries to help them replicate um, the, the programs that we uh, implement and research uh, as a way to help them reform their criminal justice systems. So uh, in terms of our operating programs, we have what we call community courts and justice centers. I know how many may be uh, familiar with the um, Midtown Community Court or the Red Hood Community Justice Center. Um, those are two of our earliest um, projects, in fact, the Center for Core Innovation began with the Midtown Community Court in 1993. And then three years later, in 1996, we became the Center for Core Innovation as an incubator project of the Fund for the City of New York. Um, as the Center for Core Innovation, we have continued to replicate uh, the community court model. Uh, that's what Red Hook became, uh, except that it was much more than just um, criminal court. It became a justice center because uh, you, the the catchment area in Red Hook, an individual could come in and see and have their cases seen for family court, for housing court, as well as criminal court. So it was a one-stop shop. And on top of that, um, there were services there geared towards the community in terms of social services and access um, to social workers, case managers, and other types of resources around all of the topics that touch housing, um, court cases, uh, family court cases and criminal justice cases. Uh, we also have what we call centralized projects and one of them is the Bronx Community Solutions and Brooklyn Justice Initiatives. Uh, that was our attempt to bring the community court model to scale. Um, so whereas Midtown and Red Hook had catchment areas and you could only get intervention at those particular projects if you were arrested within the catchment area, which is usually determined by zip codes or precincts, at Br Brooklyn Justice Initiatives and Bronx Community Solutions, anyone arrested in any part of the borough uh, could come to the centralized court part and have access to a community court type of uh, plea disposition or an alternative to incarceration um, programming. Then we have community-based programmings, and I'm not sure how many of you are uh, acquainted with the Brownsville Community Justice Center, and that is uh, a center just focus on the Brownsville community. It's not operated as a court. It has no direct relationship to the court. It's really around addressing um, issues within the community. It's really about giving the community a platform around um, the problems that they're seeing, especially with the intersection with criminal justice, even though they're not um, a community court and they're there's no police, there's no court officers there, um, but it's around helping and empowering and providing resources 
some of the work that they've done is what we call placemaking, and that is taking areas of the community that um, have traditionally have problems around mugging, around um, drugs, and reclaiming, working with communities to reclaim those spaces. So they'll um, help spruce up or uh, get up and running uh, a community basketball court, and then have the kids in the community be able to go there and use and utilize it. Um, so that may be um, new hoops, uh, lights, uh, making sure that uh, residents feel safe coming back and reclaiming that space. Uh, then we started about three years ago with early diversion. That was a center's attempt to help individuals not even reach the court or reach the um, criminal justice. Uh, these are focused on individuals who receive what we call desk appearance tickets, DATs. And if you receive a DAT, you're eligible for a diversion. That means that you have the option of getting um, a brief intervention, usually lasts um, between 90 minutes to two hours. And if you complete that intervention, then the prosecutor declines to prosecute your case and you never have to come to court in front of the judge. And then there's supervised release, which was um, the city's uh, attempt at bail reform. Uh, supervised release began with pilot projects out of the Criminal Justice Agency, CJA. The first one started in 2009 in Queens with fe nonviolent felonies. It was then expanded to New York County, again, for nonviolent felonies. And then the center did a pilot in Brooklyn for misdemeanor cases. Then in 2016, this, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice decided to expand citywide and brought three providers on, the Criminal Justice Agency, Cases, and the Center for Court Innovation. And so for the last three plus years, with the three of us have been operating um, supervised release programs. And the Center for Court Innovation has three out of the five boroughs, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. So the center's theory of change is uh, we're not a traditional advocacy organization. Um, the way that you see a VERA, for example. What we do is we partner with justice stakeholders like district attorneys, offense lawyers, um, community-based organizations, and judges. And we go to them to identify what they are perceiving as problems or what we perceive as problems and seeing if we can come together and collaborate on the solutions. So we are all about culture and system change from within, uh, but also, and most importantly, bringing a clinical approach and services inside of the courthouse. And that has really been, um, I believe, what has helped a lot of the justice reform that you see now. The fact that social workers have really been at the forefront. Um, we employ a lot of social workers. They're the ones that provide services in our alternative to incarceration programs, our diversion programs, and our supervised release programs. Um, social workers have a lot of power within our agency in terms of um, we don't hold them back just in the office. They can come to court and advocate for clients if, if that's what's required and that's what the client needs. But most importantly, they're a person that's there when a client is at one of its worst um, times, like being arrested, going through the stress of being incarcerated, and really um, being the first friendly face in court or after court, and really trying to meet them where they're at and help them with um, what they perceive to be the most important things in their lives. And then identifying and addressing needs and gaps in services, which is what I just mentioned. So in terms of the highlights and successes in over 20 years at the center, we've helped over 30,000 people each year um, who come through the criminal justice systems or who are in community. Um, over 2,500 of those clients were through supervised release and they avoided pretrial um, jail time each year, uh, which really, I'll get more into what the impact that has when I speak more about supervised release. And then we improve the outcomes for our program participants in terms of avoiding unnecessary incarceration and collateral consequences, such as losing their job, losing custody, um, and then connecting participants to community-based services. So how do social workers make our work possible? Like I've 
keep repeating, they're on the front lines working with vulnerable populations, um, meeting with clients as they come into the quarter community offices, conducting assessments to, underline the, to understand the underlying factors that brought someone into the system, connecting clients to voluntary community-based services, bringing a social work perspective to the legal setting. And I really cannot stress that enough because it's when I started in 2009 working in criminal court arraignments in the Bronx, there was a lot of, um, a lot of tension uh, and also kind of like a lot of disdain towards the social work approach in terms of viewing clients as, as individuals, as individuals with needs. Um, everyone that came through the system was just seen as either a charge or just like a criminal. And I can say that in the time that I've been doing this work, I see judges now be the ones to advocate for social services. They have a much better understanding of the individual that's in front of them and what the particular needs that may be bringing them into the system because social workers have been there to really educate and give them that information and change minds and change hearts. Um, so like I said, connect, connecting clients to voluntary and community-based services, um, helping people avoid unnecessary incarceration, uh, both pre-trial but also post, because um, the way that the center began was as an alternative to incarceration. So that meant that an individual took a plea, and the plea was to either community service or social services or some type of treatment, short-term treatment. Um, and in exchange for that, they weren't sentenced to or sent to jail. Um, oh, there is a jail alternative attached to alternative to incarceration programs. Um, but most of the time, we did see that the majority of our clients who came through the program were able to avoid jail. Uh, so making treatment recommendations to the court in lieu of traditional jail sentences, what I just spoke about, and enhancing procedural justice. So uh, what is social work practice in the criminal setting? Um, we provide direct services through a clinical lens. Um, we employ motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. Um, we conduct biopsychosocial assessments and we do crisis intervention. Um, we're trauma informed and we trained individuals um, that come work for our organization in trauma informed approaches and practices. Um, we're very client centered and all this from an anti oppression framework. So what is a day in the life of a social worker or a case manager in the center? Um, so you'll be conducting intakes, um, what we call screenings, which are short-term um, brief assessments, which are flagging potential issues. And based on what those screenings say, does a person have um, potential needs? Does a person not have potential needs? If they do, then there is a more in-depth assessment um, that we would do to follow up on that. If they don't, they would really focus on engagement and seeing what are the positive factors or protective factors in their lives. And um, we work with them to make sure that they continue to be there, like I said, um, before employment and um, ch uh, custody of their children is a big one um, for clients that don't have um, other needs such as substance use, mental illness. And for individuals that have low level um, needs like employment, we do have um, individuals in our organization who are trained, who work very hard with different agencies and who have been able to connect them to employment services, employment training, um, resume building, career um, building programs, and we've been very successful in that aspect. Um, so you're going to be doing individual cl clinical ma um, case management. What that means is a person may come to you, um, and we're talking about the person has a lot of needs. We see a lot of individuals with co-occurring disorders. And what we're doing is um, doing the engagement piece, but also doing a bit of um, treatment readiness with them because a lot of the times they're not in a stage of change where they've identified that um, what's in front of them or what they're going through uh, needs um, treatment or needs um, a very intense type of intervention. And because uh, in particular with the pretrial and supervised release, services are voluntary, not mandated. Um, 
really that engagement and that treatment readiness is what re really helps individuals connect to services and we are successful. We have at least a 50%, like 50% of our clients who, ne who need that actually engage and it actually leads, that engagement leads to positive dispositions in their criminal court cases. Um, so we do group facilitation, um, safety planning, gathering information from clients, collateral contacts, service providers, collecting and inputting data, referring clients to community-based services and intervention, and compliance monitoring and reporting. Something that is, um, I would say, real and, and sometimes difficult for individuals that we bring on to do this type of forensic social work or court-based social work is the aspect of compliance and the fact that we do have a duty to everyone who's mandated that if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, we have to notify our court stakeholders, that means the defense attorney, the prosecutor, and the judge. And um, all I can say is that usually we do have the trust of those individuals, of our court stakeholders, and they see us and see our social workers as the experts, so they do take whatever advice um, we give. We, we employ graduated responses to, to respond to non-compliance, but ultimately there are times when individuals are just not um, engaging and complying, and we have to report that and be very truthful with the court, and sometimes that does end in someone being taken away from the program and other types of consequences to them. So in terms of the supervised release program, it's an alternative to jail program, or to bail actually. <laughs> um, provides pretrial supervision, case management, and voluntary social services. Um, program participants are monitored to ensure appearances at court dates. Um, we are experiencing dramatic program growth because of the anticipated leg leg legislative change in January. And to meet the needs of this growing population, we're hiring, and we're hiring a lot of social workers and a lot of case managers. Um, what I'll say about the supervised release program is that it really has been a linchpin in the close Rikers campaign because in the last three plus years, um, especially since the program expanded citywide, it's really helped a lot of individuals avoid um, going to jail pre-trial. It's had an amazing impact in um, diminishing collateral consequences, negative collateral consequences. Um, it's allowed individuals to either take plea to non-incarceratory um, dispositions, to non-criminal dispositions, um, or to have their cases simply dismissed, which a lot of the times pre-supervised release, we did see a lot of people um, which who felt that the threat of having to go to jail or having bail set and not being able to make that bail did push them to not fight their case and play, take plea dispositions. Um, so these are the current open positions that we have for supervised release. Again, we're in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. We're looking for social workers, senior social workers, uh, an associate director of pretrial service in each borough, um, case managers, intake specialists, and then um, the center runs many different programs. And with the new exciting programs that we also have on deck is we are creating a centralized court in Manhattan. So in addition to the Midtown Community Court, we're gonna have the Manhattan Justice Resource Center that is a collaboration with the Manhattan um, District Attorney and three other um, organizations, cases being one of them, um, Osborne, and the uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, actually. So we're very excited and we're, going, and we're hiring um, social workers for that. As part of that, we also have um, a new pilot program. It's for felony alternative to incarceration programs. The Center for Court Innovation has been very focused on low level misdemeanor cases. There's been other agencies like Cases, the Fortune Society, and Osborne, who have always, um, had a role or um, played a role in the felony level cases, but now the center is stepping in and helping the court. Um, our role is more around the assessment piece. Um, for a long time, uh, New York City has had a problem with individuals, for example, that suffer from mental illness and the amount of time that it takes to get them assessed, to get all the records that they need and then get them placed um, into programs. So what the center is trying to do is really um, become that assessing um, upfront 
piece and really help speed up the process for them and then connect them to programs in community such as through cases, um, Osborne or Fortune who do um, traditional 18 to 24 months of um, either mental health or substance abuse treatment. Uh, we also have a driver accountability program. We've seen a lot of um, stories in the news, unfortunately, of individuals being killed because of you know, reckless driving. Uh, so we've created um, a program for individuals um, a step below, obviously, um, who have been uh, charged with reckless driving, but not any driving that has resulted in a serious injury or death. Um, this is more like a preventive step um, to stop like the person getting to the more serious charge that has a consequence and a victim. And certainly for individuals that are continuously um, caught driving without a license. And then, like I mentioned before, the Manhattan Justice Resource Center. So what are we looking for in terms of the people we bring on board? Uh, enthusiasm and interest in criminal justice, ability to handle challenges of working within a fast-paced environment and court-based social work. Um, prior experience with certain populations is a plus, such as mental health, homeless, substance use, um, uh, individual uh, partner violence as well, or de um, domestic violence, uh, flexibility and resiliency. And then this is benefits of working at the center, um, tangible and rewarding outcomes for clients, comparative salary, hours to your C social work licensing, excellent benefit packages that include health, dental, and life insurance, parental leave, ongoing professional trainings, with in-house training, continuing education units, public service loan forgiveness, employee assistance program, affinity working groups such as LGBTQ and racial justice, and institutional com commitment to promoting from within. But to that, I would add that we're really um, working on creating also uh, a program that focuses on self-care, um, because we know that um, with the populations that we work with, burnout is real, and we want to make sure that we take um, care of the people who work for us and are doing like this very difficult and important work. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Diego Valdez, so I am the director for um, pretrial services. Um, I work around um, planning and implementation of this new policy, the new way of, of, of a new life, actually, a new business that we're going into that, although we have some foundation, we've been doing it around um, since 2015, um, so a lot of the work that's happening now and goes live in, in January of 2020 is work that we've been doing already, you know. So we've been working with our partners at CCI, we've been working with our partners in the city, city government, to really um, do this and do this right. Cases have been around since 1967. Who was around 1967? I was almost there. You know, I was coming into the world. Uh, yeah. So uh, since 1967, we've been really working um, in New York City, working um, really um, with this population, working in family court, children placed in, with OCFS placement, ACS placements, um, working around misdemeanors, felonies. So going into, um, fast forwarding all the way from 1967 to 2015, really um, starting the supervised release. And what does this all uh, mean? Um, the mayor, um, the governor had a lot of say-so in the creation of this policy and procedures, le legislated the assembly um, around bail elimination act of 2019. Look it up, look it up, look it up. It's an amazing, um, the, way it's actually, the way the actual law is written is really amazing how, how someone that doesn't understand that legal language could understand exactly what the legislator is asking for us to do. A lot of the services that you heard from CCI, we, as well as cases we provide, you know, we provide that supervision on a daily basis. We provide that supervision um, depending on kind of the levels and the tiers that someone comes to us. That's kind of set um, the tone of the type of services that we'll be providing. Probation, um, historically, people that plead guilty or get or, or plea bargain or something to that effect will go to probation. Probation sometimes a lot more punitive. We're looking at this from a clinical lens. We're looking at this to have social workers really begin working um, with folks that come through the door from a clinical perspective. Not so much from a therapeutic perspective. You know, a lot of probation, or if you don't show up, you get violated, you're going to jail. 
You know, we're looking at things a little different. We're looking at why didn't you sh didn't show up and really start that therapeutic relationship um, with um, our consumers, our clients, our participant, whichever way um, the agency calls different agency calls them different things. So, um, so I went to Colombia. All right, I got it. I'm at Fordham. I went to Colombia. You know, it's still very expensive here at Fordham. Still very expensive. I got a gift. Thank you guys. You know, it's probably your student loans. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks a lot. So, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. so thank you all. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm a social worker. I, then I went to law school at Columbia, and then I really wanted to um, do this and do this right. Um, so yeah, so I, um, I take pride in the work that I do. So I, I graduated from Columbia at the age of 23 um, and began my career as a social worker and someone that really wanted to to, to help others. You know, from, I learned to help others early on from my Sunday school days. Um, I don't go to Sunday schools anymore, but I used to go to Sunday school, and that started my foundation um, in the field of social work. As Sunday school teachers are the best, you know. So, um, so for many years, I've been doing this um, in child welfare as well as the criminal justice system. Um, one of the things that I would say, go into um, cases.org, go into the websites to really, just like CCI has an amazing um, website, we as well, it gives you a lot of information around the history, the mission, the values of the agency. Uh, we're in the process of hiring a lot of people. We actually have uh, 178 people to hire. As they say where I come from, that's mucho. That's a lot, that's a lot. That number's big, right? And that was huge. We've been doing, I was talking to my colleague as we, as we start, how many interviews we've done, whether we do an individual, whether we do a group, it's very, very draining. But I know you guys that are gonna graduate from Fordham, you guys know what to say in the interview because you guys are getting prepared for this. So I get it. But um, for us, we're actually asking people to apply. Listen, if you're ready to apply, um, minimum degree we're asking folks um, is a bachelor's level for um, our case coordinator positions, our more clinical, um, coordinator positions, you need an MSW, and then from some other positions, you need a license. Um, you know, one of the things that I was, I, I, I've been offering to NYU as well, cost to Columbia, you know, students, and as well as do it at Fordham. You know, I better watch what I say, because I'm alone right here. There's a lot of Fordham people here. Uh, it's really about, you can shadow us. If you have a day off, you know, uh, if you have a day off um, in the next couple of weeks, come over, email me, Diego Valdez, I mean, my God, you can't forget that email. It's DiegoValdez at cases.org, you know. Um, and really, um, just you know, email me. You can shadow us in court. You can shadow us um, how we do clinical practice, how we how we um, do some of our intervention. We um, have adapted the CBT model, so um, we, we we feel comfortable. You know, evidence based shows that this model works with this population, so we're very married to it. But definitely, um, some of my other colleagues in the mental health field use some other, um, some other models as well, you know, and that's great. Um, so yeah, so shadow us, um, email me. Do, I mean, if you email me, I'll email you right back and say, hey, when can you come over? Um, there's a lot that goes on in court, a lot that goes on in arraignment, a lot. I spent um, last week, almost the entire week in Supreme Court. Judges, DA, um, actually, let me just take a step back. The week that I spent um, in Supreme Court last week, um, a lot's going on with the district attorney's office. They're not very happy with this new legislation. They're not very happy. Um, they're totally against it, and they made it very clear. They make it clear in private meetings. They, made it, they make it very clear in, in different articles that are published um, anonymously, or they put their names to it. Um, they go on the record very negative about um, um, this new law. So um, you, you're exposed to that, you know, you can hear that. So shattering um, is very good at Supreme Court. Arraignment, there's a lot that goes on in arraignment. Because remember, somebody got arrested, they go see a judge within 24 hours, and a lot goes on there as well. We have court representatives, so we're hiring for court representatives, um, level one. We're hiring for court representative level two. Um, and please don't ask me what the one and two means. I'm assuming that it's experience or degrees or something, but no one yet could tell me. But the one and two. Uh, then we have um, senior court representatives. I get, you know, I get that. You had a good, more experience. I get it. Um, so we have some of those. Then we have like um, that we're so we're hiring those three for those three categories: one, two, and senior, um, and really um, as well as social workers and senior social worker. Uh, this is an amazing time for everyone in this room. You're looking for jobs. Once you get out of Fordham, within 30 to 60 days, you're going to get a letter from your student loans to pay up. 
That was a joke. Come on, guys. <laughs> right? I mean, it is serious, right? No, no. <laughs> it's so serious. No. So it is important. <laughs> so it is, it is so important. Start applying. Go to cases. Apply. We'll bring you in. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, kind of where you fit and have that conversation. And, and you could start sooner before you graduate with the promise that you graduate. You know, we, we are doing um, some of that because we're, we're, we're struggling. We're struggling as the aging team finding really good people, you know. And I know that Fordham produces um, good people, you know, and, and, and that's why I wanted to be here. Um, but I'll take some questions, um, you know, ask me whatever you want to ask me, or ask us. You know, um, any questions that you might have, anything you think I might have left out, but please go into um, cases.org and a lot of the information is there. Just as you go to CCI, you look at um, About Us, go to um, Careers and this, all the positions are there. All of the positions, right, 178 positions. Keep remembering that. Keep remembering when you graduate what happens in 30 days. Got to pay up. Got to pay up, so you need JOBs. So um, it's really important to, um, um, but, but, but besides that you apply, besides that you go on the website, you have to have a passion for this work. You know, if this is not in you, and you're better with early interventions of the world, going to a high school as a school social worker, I wish you the best of luck. Do that. But if you're passionate about criminal justice, these are the agencies you need to tap in. You know, um, CCI does amazing work. You know, I always, um, they don't get the credit they deserve from it, you know, because they're always sort of in the back. They're doing a whole bunch of work, but you don't see them all, always at the front. But in the back, when everybody's sleeping, they're working hard. Cases takes a different approach. They want to be always on TV, <laughs> you know, on uh, the camera, right? So they, always want to be on, they always want to be on TV doing well and advocating, um, you know, so it's, um, so, but no, but that's kind of the strength of different agencies and they do it differently. You know, so, um, you know, I remind you folks, um, I've gotten a lot in Brooklyn, from Brooklyn. Oh my God, a jail's gonna be built here. How could this happen? There's one there already. It's on Atlantic Avenue. Right across the street from the mall, right across the street. It's, it's been there. Nothing has changed. So then they're like, oh. Same thing um, in the Bronx. We have, we ha we ha you know, ju we ha Juvenile, we have Sparfit, we have the undergrounds, the, um, courthouse. Now I believe they're building one uh, not so far from Lincoln Hospital in, by the hub. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people. Yeah. But you have a lot of people complaining, seeing how could this happen, but they, ha they, they haven't done their homework. Right. They've been there. Right. Yeah, I mean, in terms of backlash to our agencies, not really. I haven't seen that. I think everyone's focused on the legislation and Albany. Um, and the fact that they're the ones that pass it and they kind of like put together what, yeah. what will happen in terms of our agencies. We both, Cases and the Center for Coordination, work closely with our communities and, you know, there's, there's systems. Yes, individuals are not going to want um, prisons for multiple of reasons in their communities, but it's the same as you see when they're trying to bring um, some type of affordable housing Correct. or some type yeah. of um, shelter, supportive, housing. supportive housing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same. same. It's Absolutely. Like any uh, political scenario, isn't there a huge lobby effort by the bail bondsman? <laughs> I wonder about them. How does that change? Because, hey, I have a job. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. I haven't seen it. Actually, I haven't seen it. And I think part of that is, is because bail has not been eliminated in New York. Right, They're still hasn't. bailable offenses. Absolutely. I thought maybe you very briefly close with some aren't familiar just to sketch some of the highlights again. No, I mean this bill will will exist. You know, so they still but maybe not in that they'll have that high volume that they used to have a couple of years ago. Um, <coughs> maybe. Um, I foresee that. But um, How yeah. Do you Yeah, they do have a number of folks that are leaving Rikers Island, the, the ones that are in Rikers Island by December 31st. Um, the hope is that a lot of, of the defendants that are, are going to, through actual their, their court days are being released on or about December 31st. Then the law kicks in on January 1st. That number, I don't know. Um, I've heard the number from now to December 31st about a little over 1,300. Folks are being released. 
uh, but I don't want to go on or the record. Or currently detained. Or currently detained, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So between the individuals who are currently detained, that would be eligible for, for different release. type of yeah. bail setting. Um, that would be the 1300 Correct. but then obviously there's the amount of individuals who come January 1st will no longer be eligible for detention. Absolutely. Um, so I see you both sort of by the CTV model in your agencies, right? Um, who, how often are the clients coming into the program? Or is this like a weekly thing that they have to come in? Yeah, so, uh, so that's Tuesday, right? So yesterday we had about 45 intakes that were done this morning. Today, before I left the office, we had 10. So every day that number is increasing. So we do, um, our folks in Raymond, as well as the different court parts, criminal court and Supreme Court, they go in and advocate um, on behalf of the defendants to be released. Uh, once that application is granted, the next day within 24 hours, 48 hours, um, we want to see the individual. So we're doing intakes. We're doing a lot of intakes on a daily basis. So we get anywhere, anywhere from 25 to 30 um, uh, new cases a day, roughly. And in terms, I think that I understood, correct me if I'm wrong, your question to be how often are we seeing them? Oh, okay. and, so that, and so that depends on supervision. So we have supervision levels. We have five levels of supervision. Um, at the lowest level, at level one, we're meeting with a person once a month. At the highest level, level four or five, we're meeting with a person once a week. Yeah. So when you, get, when you do the intake, you're planning out with them and, um, and their parents are involved in this or is oh. this just between? Are you speaking about juveniles? Because yeah. they, they, now 16 and 17 year olds are officially out of the criminal justice system. They're well, Correct. internally, yep, yep, yep. they're getting diverted. Like yep. they, they do get brought and seen in front of a judge in criminal court, but then from there they can be removed to Correct. family court and Correct. juvenile they justice system. The age, right, so. yes. the legislation yeah. raised the age, right. right. Um, so we don't have to meet with parents, parents although yeah. in our practice we try to work with family. I think that, that's a really important protective factor for individuals. Absolutely. Um, and so when we worked with 17 and 16 year olds, yes, working or engaging the parents and the family was very important. Absolutely. And one of our boroughs in the Bronx, we've been very successful in reaching out to probation and parole because we do have clients that are active. Yeah. And so we've, we've been successful in, in that borough in particular. I guess, you know, since it's a unified system and we think of New York City as like New York City, but each borough really has and agencies and, part, and you know, yeah. players, like um, institutional players in each borough really have their own way of doing things. And so that th that's the same with parole and probation, but we've been very successful in the Bronx with forging relationships. And I actually think that um, we've, we work with a lot of probation and parole officers that are not interested in violating clients. Correct. And they welcome the fact that we're trying to work with them and, and that we report back to them on the person's engagement and compliance. Yeah. Each borough has its own kind of flavor. What you could do in Brooklyn, you can't do in the Bronx. But Bronx, yeah. So, so we actually um, have been successful um, with probation and parole in Manhattan. You know, a lot of them has kind of meet us halfway when they get to, you know, I'm going to violate this one. Oh, no, we jump in, we, talk, we have a conversation, and immediately the violation is off the table. Um, so we've been very successful around um, that in Manhattan, not so much in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is very punitive. It's like, no, no, no. You continue doing the work, but he's getting violated. So then the work, um, we take the work where? To court. And we begin advocating for that individual in court in front of a judge. Yeah. So I have a question regarding, I guess, the operation of um, the supervised release program. So cases will mostly be handling um, individuals released to Manhattan or that previously uh, lived in the borough of Manhattan? So cases will be, yeah, so we have Manhattan. Um, a lot of folks that come through the Manhattan um, Criminal Court um, have a home address in Brooklyn, Queens, right, Staten so Island. Office, so we have offices um, in every borough with the exception of Staten Island. Okay. 
So in, in those instances, um, would that individual be uh, referred over to CCI, being that CCI is doing Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, or does that remain uh, cases? We'll be servicing that person in the Bronx where that person lives. Yeah. And, to, and to be more specific, yeah. um, the way that it works is where you're getting arrested and the court right. that you're being seen in. Correct. So anyone, regardless of where they live, live. in New yeah. York City or outside of New York City, because I'm sure you get a lot of outside yeah, of do, New yes. York City as well. Um, yeah. If your case is in New York County, you are supervised by cases. Right. If your case is in Brooklyn, Bronx, or Staten Island, you're supervised by the Center for Core Innovation. We do have cases sometimes where someone was previously um, charged in Brooklyn and they're under supervision with us in Brooklyn, but then they pick up another case, they reoffend while they're still on the pending case. And then we work together to make sure that if, if they're, again, put under supervision, that the two agencies are working together so that Absolutely. the person doesn't have to do supervision twice. twice. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to thank see you all you. so much.